proof of work works yeah right we know it works uh we know where it doesn't work we know where it works but it works right bitcoin works it works like magic yeah. right uh, now proof of stake is a big deal uh, does it work we're going to find out won't we favor picture your favorite crypto app or exchange got it now i have five questions for you question number 1 does your favorite app or exchange have fiat on and off ramps that do not charge you crazy fees question number 2 does your app actually help you time your investments with machine learning and algorithms question number 3 does your app or favorite exchange connect to multiple exchanges to get you best rates best liquidity but also mitigate the risk of a central failure of one single order book question number 4 is your favorite app or exchange swiss made but also licensed and regulated in the eu so that you can feel 100% reassured but also sleep well at night question number 5 is your favorite app or exchange fully aligned with your principles and values 100% community centric and not vc backed So if your answer to any of these questions is a no, what are you waiting for? Download the Swissborg Wealth app, join the new era wealth management and enjoy the ride. Dear crypto community blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Crypto Nights. The no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And here is the season 3 finale with another mind-blowing guest, AJ Triparty. worked for consensus for binance someone who has extensive knowledge to share tons of goodies for you guys ajit a pleasure to have you today how are you doing my friend great to meet you alex having a great time yes yeah, thank living you. living the good life living the good life you living know i've, I've seen you as a keynote speaker here in london you've been giving amazing talks educating people about the blockchains you have such good experience so i'm really excited about today's interview pleasure man the pleasure is entirely mine thanks for inviting me alex Absolutely absolutely yes. and I would love to ask you Ajit about your transition right so you were in the traditional world of finance right yeah, you worked yeah. for some of the big banks goldman and in others but all of a sudden you moved into the crypto space tell us your big why yeah so you know i uh, i mean until 2009 2010 the industry was doing really well and uh, i mean investment banking was a little bit like crypto right so if you were on a trading floor Uh, doing quant and risk work the technology was amazing you could change a lot of things you could build build really really cool things so if you're a nerd and you really like building i mean it was really amazing right at goldman now and then i went into and then this financial crisis hit and then you went to work for another investment bank and it was nothing like it was before so it was boring it was bureaucratic i mean you wanted to you know you needed the money but you wanted to kind of stop living after a while <laughs> <laughs> so and then i ended up in consulting working for pwc absolutely amazing firm yeah don't get me wrong but then uh, my job was so boring uh, i really wanted to do a little bit something a little bit more interesting with my life and there was this blockchain thing going around that nobody wanted to touch so i pitched the idea of starting a little bit of a blockchain business right uh, to to some of the partners at pwc and and it took some time but i think once the I was lucky that the hype was just picking up at the time and you know a lot of really in, important clients uh consulting is all about clients right yeah. you you really live to serve clients uh Bank of England were interested and UBS were interested and a lot of uh, really really big banks wanted to talk about blockchain they wanted to know what this thing is because you know Blythe Masters and a whole bunch of people were really starting to talk to them about how this was going to change everything and uh, so i was kind of lucky to really you know uh start uh, this whole block talking to people about blockchain and then suddenly 
lots of senior clients, you know, this, at CEO level were inviting this nobody, nothing director, while a lot of partners were wondering when, a, how come this kid is getting to talk to all the, all the big guys and we are not. So, so they figured that there was something going on there and, you know, there was a lot of interest in, uh, in the community and, uh, I mean, especially amongst banks, right? Because this technology really started in, uh, in, in financial services one way or the other. It started with the idea of changing how payments are done, how money moves around on the internet. And banks felt threatened by it, so they were really interested in knowing about it. And then, when, uh, and then sort of PwC figured that, you know, in the UK, that there was, it, it was about time to put in some money into this and really hire a few people. So that's how I really got into it. And, and also because nobody really wanted to do it, right? So it was the kind of thing people do on the dark web. And the fun part is that people who didn't know anything about blockchain technology knew about the dark web. So they thought blockchain was something yeah. to do with the dark web. And I was like, all right, no, wait, 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 this got real applications. Mm -hmm. So I really started out in enterprise blockchain, not so much in crypto in the beginning. I did it because I was just bored out of my mind and, and it worked out really well. That yeah, sounds really yeah. good. And then if you fast forward a little bit, consensus, Ethereum. Yeah. Obviously Ethereum was a, <laughs> is a massive topic from the early days. It's like, okay, Bitcoin has a smart contract now. It's, it's more evolved. And, and it's still a huge topic, right? ETH 2.0 is, uh, what, what was your experience like working with Consensus, Ethereum? Like what were some of the successful things that you've seen? Yeah, we had a, we had a great thing going, right? So, uh, so I had a lot of good things going at PwC. We, we, we worked on VTrade, which is the first, the world's first enterprise blockchain platform that went into production production, right? With real customers, real banks. So um, I have some really good stories. And then I met Joe, uh, Joe was building out uh, this little firm called Consensus in, 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 in Luxembourg. And I gave him a piece of my mind. I was like, Joe, what the fuck are you doing? It kind of literally went like that, right? So it was like, Joe, I, I, whatever you're doing doesn't make any sense. I was wrong, he was right, right? I mean, that's just, uh, he kind of uh, had this big vision about what he was doing. He saw a lot of things coming. And I was much more focused on this whole bank enterprise side of things because of where I worked. And Joe figured out that this was a bigger game and you know, this was about the internet. And, and I got into this crazy debate with Joe in, in, in Luxembourg. And I told him that whatever he was doing was effectively, didn't make any sense, right? And so he kind of liked, so Joe is, Joe, is, Joe is this Zen master kind of guy. He really liked what I had to say. And, and he thought there was a different perspective on this whole technology and everything. And, and then I met him at Consensus and, and he, wa he was hiring anyone who was any good at this thing, right? So at that point, Consensus was really growing very fast. And he connected with me and he was like, why don't you come on board? And I was very fortunate to be part of that team because, you know, at the time, anybody, a lot of good developers, especially developers, right, wanted to go work for Consensus. A lot of good startups wanted to be part of Consensus venture ecosystem. Mainly because Joe was such an inspirational, yeah. you know, long horizon leader. He had this, uh, this and he was investing in complete moonshots, right? Yeah. So in true visionary things that uh, were so different from anything that anyone in enterprise was doing. So that was really inspiring, to be honest, right? And, and it was great to be part of that ecosystem. And it, it felt uh, inspiring and it kind of drew a lot of energy and and emotions out of you, you know, you kind of believed in, and I still believe in a lot of what Joe is doing. That's fantastic. So it was at the key component because a lot of people talk about Ethereum's core advantage. Obviously it's a first mover in terms of smart contracts, but on top of that, people say the backing in terms of the amount of engineers and developers, was it Joe's vision and his personality that brought the engineers to come? Not just Joe, in fact, right? So Ethereum was uh, very lucky to have a lot of strong leaders, yeah, right? Vitalik, Charles, for example. Vitalik, Let's start with yeah, Vitalik. I yeah. mean, there was this uh, developer guy who felt like uh, a developer who was a developer that everybody could rally around. You, you know, if you are a developer, and I spent most of my career being a developer before I got into sales and consulting. And uh, if you were a developer, you looked at him and you're like, it was like the Mark Andreessen of our era, right? You looked at Vitalik and you were like, he's one of us. And developers rallied around him. Then Joe did something very, very interesting, right? Joe figured out, uh, Joe's uh, critical insight was that he figured out that two things were really required to make Ethereum work. One was infrastructure, right? So things like Infura, uh, things like MetaMask, 
right? So the core components that made it possible for developers to interact with the blockchain. And the second thing was applications. Applications. You know, so, I mean, okay, you build the network. Let's say you have AT&T's phone lines, right? But if nobody's using, you don't have the end telephone, you don't have those, I mean, the smartphones, and you have all this wireless network, what is it worth? So so Joe, Joe's genius wasn't really, and, and there were a lot of other good people, right? Gavin and... Yeah, uh, so so Ethereum was very Gavin lucky. Later, Ethereum was, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have to be careful with that. <laughs> so I love Gavin, by the way. So, you know, it's so... Uh, so I think Ethereum was very lucky to have a lot of really strong personalities that uh, didn't necessarily get along with each other, but had very different perspectives and contribution to the whole thing. And but, but I think Joe did a lot, right? Joe was instrumental in building a company, a community. Uh, he had this consistent messaging about this, you know, making the world a better place. So, and it was really, really important when all the regulators and everyone was looking at this whole new technology with suspicion. And you had this Bitcoin community really getting excited about disrupting the banks and you know revolution and fucking the system over. Joe was coming in with messages which were about you know making the world a better place, making humanity a better place. So so I think Joe's messaging, his marketing, his ability to really build a community and infrastructure was incredible. So Joe Joe gets a lot of credit in my book. Uh, so it kind of moved people, right? They felt aligned yeah, with his they, idea. They felt like they wanted message. to be part of something bigger be than them, this, right? Yeah. We all. A lot of great people want to do something that's bigger than them, and Joe made it all feel like it was bigger than any of us. So that, that's incredible, and, and like you mentioned, you can see it on GitHub, right? The amount of contributions, the amount yeah. of, you know, it, it, you can see the activity of Ethereum, and it just has more people involved thanks to great leadership, like you're saying. Great leadership all around, yeah. Right, and but nowadays, so this year, there's a lot of criticism and, and skepticism, I would say, with regards to E2.0. You know, like, uh, for example, we have Cardano suddenly come up you know, from yeah, the woods, yeah, yeah. out of the woods. And a lot of people are kind of saying that E2.0 is, is going to be a very, very difficult transition or, or, and very concerned, especially the geeks, obviously, um, are saying that it's not feasible. How are you seeing this? Do you, are you still, do you still have hope for E2.0? Yeah, I don't want to be expelled from Ethereum, right? So <laughs> yeah. I'm already working with R3 on some of their startups, yeah. so that doesn't make me any popular. So, I mean, the way I see it is, remember Netscape? Yeah. Right, Netscape uh, had over 80% of the market share at one point. And uh, it felt like Netscape was unbeatable and nobody could touch it, right? And that sort of uh, arrogance set into the Netscape community and whatnot. And I mean, Ethereum isn't quite there, but now I see, you know, developers. So Ethereum's power is in developers, right? I mean, uh, and nobody has really offered anything that's, uh, there have been lots of Ethereum killers, right? Uh, Charles is an incredibly smart guy. Uh, there are lots of really, Tezos founders are really smart people. But what, nobody's got the mix right, right? And it's just, it's, it's not just one thing. So Ethereum offered something compelling and something completely different from what Bitcoin had to offer. Nobody has really given something that's, you know, compelling enough and different enough. It's got to be different, right? It's got to have something more than what Ethereum has to offer. So now with, uh, so that's the first thing, right? So Ethereum added smart contracts. That was a powerful new feature. Uh, Bitcoin was open to only so many developers. It wasn't, you know, you had to be a really, really good protocol developer to work on Bitcoin. But you could be an, a pretty decent application de developer. You could write pretty shitty Solidity code and still come up with yams, right? I mean, people are still doing that and making a lot of money. So, so Ethereum made it possible for, like Java, Right, mm. Ethereum was like Java. I mean, it made it possible for bad developers or average developers to do something with this really new powerful platform. And nobody has really made a dent in that. Now, Ethereum 2.0 is interesting, right? Because if you look at Avalanche, if you look at, everyone is saying, oh, Ethereum only does seven trans you know, 12 transactions a second, why not? Does anyone really care? Right, it's not, uh, now uh, with Ethereum 2.0, I think I think that the trouble is the expectations have been set very very high, right? And it and and I worked with Vlad Zamfir on on CBC Casper um, very recently on some of the you know the, the grants and some of the other commercial aspects. And uh, Vlad has lots and lots of great ideas. Ethereum 2.0 is a compromise compared to you know what where Ethereum is going to be. Really? Yeah, yeah. Ethereum 2.0 is, is a practical compromise, right? So if you really want to do correct by construction Casper, and if you really want to do uh, Ethereum as it can be, then then it's going to take a long time, right? So you want 
you eventually want to get rid of solidity. You want to have, you know, WebAssembly. You want to have a much more robust programming environment. You want to have better tools and so on. So, Ethereum 2.0 has a long roadmap. It's an incredibly hard coordination problem to get everyone from Ethereum 1.0 to 2.0 and, and because it's so decentralized, it literally is decentralized. You don't have a, you can't have Vitalik saying, oh, we need to deliver tomorrow or Joe delivers. Uh, so, so it's, it's a really hard coordination problem. Now, if Ethereum 2.0 will have some issues, right? So, you will have very high gas fees on some of the shards that are more used than, than the others. You will have some UX issues because, uh, you know, there are, uh, there is imperfect load balancing on different shards. So, do I see any other protocols solving all of those issues right now? I don't really see anyone else solving those issues, right? And then the question is, what do developers care about? Do developers really care about any, any of this? And, and don't forget the network effects, right? So, what Netscape didn't have is network effects. You know, you had a Netscape server, you had a, uh, a Netscape browser, but you could easily switch. Uh, you know, uh, Microsoft started giving the internet uh, information server IIS for free and that's really what hurt Netscape, right? Not just the browser. Uh, the bundling of the, of the browser came later. So, with Ethereum, the, the value is that you are on Ethereum, the other guy is also on Ethereum, right? Yeah. So, you have this, a little bit of this community, but also network effects, right? The users know yeah. how to work with Ethereum, the developers know how, to, and all the other developers know how to work with Ethereum. So, who's going to disrupt that? I think it's a harder problem than it seems, and it's not just about throughput and, but who has got a good chance? I think, you know, if I had to put my money on something, I would put my money on Gavin. Gavin, He knows yeah. exactly what he's doing, right? He so, exactly. Polkadot is, is if, if anyone can win right now, I would put my money on Polkadot. You didn't ask, but I'm going to tell you anyways. I, w I wanted to ask you exactly about that right. because it's kind of like the battle of the blockchains now. You know, a lot of people are wondering because they're th the third gen, you know, blockchains. We have uh, Cardano, we have Elrond, we have, yeah, you mentioned Polkadot, Kusama. You know, there are quite a lot of players coming into the play. And uh, yeah, and that's actually exactly what I wanted to ask you next. You know, like yeah. among all these potential blockchains, obviously Ethereum has the engineers. It also has the adoption, like use cases, right? Many people are building. Yeah, it's got on a whole it. ecosystem. It's, it's got, got a tools, whole and Joe built a lot of those tools, right? Yeah, exactly. consensus, consensus built MetaMask and Infura and God knows what else. So you can have yeah. the fastest, the most scalable blockchain, the f highest throughput throughout the entire ecosystem. But if nobody uses it then it's worthless, right? Yeah, it's, it's, you gotta be, have people building apps on it. You gotta have people building it. And that, yeah. without a doubt, Ethereum is the master, as you right. said. Um, but uh, what? It, so what is your overall impression? Because Gavin seems like the perfect story, you know, for Polkadot Uprising. Yeah. He's seen Ethereum, he's very active on GitHub when it comes to Polkadot. How, how are you seeing this playing out? I think Polkadot has a lot of good ideas, right? I think uh, Gavin knows Ethereum on the inside. He, he's seen the evolution, he's been part of the whole story. Uh, he's seen what's worked and what what didn't work. So with Polkadot, you know, he's systematically building a community, right? So if you go back to Joe's speech at DevCon last year, he talked about uh, community, right? The one thing that he emphasized was the ecosystem. He said, it's not the killer uh, technology, it's the killer ecosystem. So Joe, uh, so Gavin is going quite systematically and, you know, forget the tech, the tech is great, but he's going quite systematically about building a community, about this whole marketing aspect. Right, so Ethereum is the incumbent, right? So it's like, it's, you have to disrupt Ethereum. Like Ethereum started to disrupt Bitcoin in certain ways, right? And we were looking at serious flipping at one, at one point before the whole market crashed. Uh, now, so you have to disrupt this incumbent, right? How are you gonna do that? You can't do it by playing the same game as the incumbent. So you have to play a completely different game. I don't think Polkadot have figured that out yet, right? So, you know, the, the, if you look at how the, they're building the community and how kind of they're slowly, carefully, methodically yeah. sort of getting the message out and getting developers involved. But what they haven't spoken to yet, uh, Gavin hasn't spoken to yet, is what's really, really different, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. But one thing he's doing right is he's focusing on developers, and right? Developers, he's not worried yeah. about anything else right now. So if you look at how they're building the community, then it's all about the devs. And that's what Ethereum got right. That's what Apple got right. That's what Microsoft got right. You know, uh, and I was a Microsoft developer uh, after I worked on Unix. It's all about getting apps built. And, and I think the question is, who has the patience to hang, hang in there for five years 
uh, three to five years and really fight the battle. And then, you know, Ethereum 2.0 isn't the last thing. I mean, Ethereum will build a 3.0 and a 4.0. And what worries me about Ethereum is that, uh, you know, uh, there are lots and lots of bright people who are in it for the technology. Those are the ones I would bet on. But there is, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's really concerning. Different people uh, with different motives. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that. There are a lot of things I worry about. And, and Ethereum 2.0 isn't it. I worry about uh, uh, somebody writing another billion dollar smart contract and getting a lot of ETH, ETH stuck in it, but that would really undermine. That. If you have another hard fork, that would hurt. That would hurt, yeah. You know what, the hard forks are obviously uh, not a, a, a beautiful picture. And, and also that kind of is a perfect segue for DeFi, you know, and its impact on Ethereum as yeah, well. Yeah. And I'd love to ask you about that, but it does sound like Gavin is kind of taking a few you know, lessons from, from the, the book of Joe Lubin and building doing. community. Yeah. Is that really the most important thing when building a blockchain is to getting these devs on board, making them believe the vision? I, th I think it's like building any other startup, right? You have to learn. Yeah. Uh, so what Polkadot are doing right is that they're learning. You know, so if you look at some of the other competitors, so there are lots of good tech in the space, but they haven't spent enough time learning. They've got hung up on one thing, right? Or they have over-promised. They have promised the perfect solution. Yeah. You know, like Definity, I mean, great team, really, really smart tech people, but they have promised uh, Nirvana. Uh, uh, you shouldn't promise Nirvana yeah. as a startup because you don't know what it's like, yeah, right? So like. what, what Polkadot are doing right is they're learning. Right? And, and by the way, I don't own any Polkadot right now. I would like to, uh, but I'm, yeah. So, so, so they're kind of taking their time to learn and really iterate and figure it out. When I went to DevCon 1, I mean, you, you met these guys, you shook hands and you know, I was I was arguing with Joe a year later or two years later, and you kind of didn't know it was going to get this big, right? So, uh, with Polkadot, I think what they're doing is they're taking their time, they're learning, they're figuring out what works, and none of the other blockchains have done that, right? They've got hung up on one idea, and so, you know, or uh, tra throughput. Throughput, yeah. Does anyone care? We don't know, right? I mean, how do you know? You have? Are you learning? Are you measuring anything out there? Are you actually tracking your success? So, uh, with, uh, or with Tezos, they said, oh, we have these great technical ideas. We have a formally vi verifiable language. Now, you know, developers look at that and they, they go, okay, so, right? So, so I think uh, it, it's about the learning process and Ethereum did that right. They took their time to learn. They made a lot of mistakes and Joe specifically invested in a lot of mistakes, right? So Joe put in a lot of his personal money in making a lot of mistakes and that's what really really is so inspiring about that story that with Polkadot I think they're taking it slow they're learning uh, are they the last word on blockchain nobody is the last word on blockchain we are so early now DeFi Ethereum lives on applications you know like iPhones live on apps you don't have apps you don't have iPhones so Ethereum might have its problems but if it, if it doesn't have apps it's got nothing right for apps you need devs so ICO we knew it was going to be problematic, you know, there were going to be lots of legal, regulatory challenges, whatnot. But it was an application that consumers wanted. DeFi is an application that gets people excited. And I mean, like consumers, right? And traders and a whole bunch of people who are not in it for the technology gets excited. So DeFi is kind of the next logical step. But I see was really risky. Uh, yes, absolutely. You know, once the EOS sell-off started, Ethereum had to crash, right? And I, I, I had a too much of my net worth in it, so I feel the pain. Mm -hmm. So you now with DeFi, it's the same story. Is there a lot of risk in it? Sure, but if uh, Ethereum doesn't make those mistakes or doesn't take the same kind of risk, it's not going to evolve. And it's and the way this thing works is right. Once you build better apps, the technology has to evolve to meet the, where the apps are, right? So Ethereum 2.0 is required because gas prices are so shit, mm -hmm. right? Because it's so painful to use that thing right now. That's why we are spending so much time and energy on getting Ethereum 2.0 done, right? Whether it's consensus or anywhere else. If you don't have apps, what's forcing the technology to evolve? Yeah. You know, why do you even need better Macs, better Windows, better phones, if you don't have any more apps that demand better, better network, better infrastructure? So Ethereum has got something right about it, right? So we'll go through a lot of pain, we'll go through a lot of crashes, we'll crash and burn once in a while, but the power of Ethereum is 
it's a free for all i mean it evolves really really quickly i just hope that you know some of the really cool guys like ben uh and and the the guys who are really working on the core protocols just can stay focused through the next 4 or 5 months and not fuck it up not, yeah that's a really good point and, and you know because you know when it, when you think about the gas fees right and the network fees and and kind of the the complaints that we have recently like you know if I really pictured tell me if I'm wrong and please correct me if I'm wrong like I see Ethereum like if 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 your Ethereum was a big shopping mall right I do see these apps like little shops within the shopping mall but the problem for me is that Ethereum doesn't own these shops they're using the platform but they could migrate eventually to sure. another blockchain yeah, yeah. I mean, are you, are you concerned about that like No 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 I mean Ethereum is not the lord's last word on blockchain it shouldn't be right i mean i don't know ethereum is not my company it's nobody's company that's the good news yeah, right good so news, yeah. so think about it this way ethereum success is its biggest problem right i mean nobody is complaining about network fees or minor fees on picker and on tezos yeah. right i mean yeah. great tech but nobody is complaining about it because people aren't using it nobody is complaining about the fees on eos because nobody is using nobody it is using so it. ethereum mm -hmm. success is its problem is that a good problem absolutely right so think about it this way so we used to i used to work for a telecoms firm back in 1999 and we started getting a bunch of call drops right that's a really bad thing in in telecoms right you don't want to have drop calls because customers complain your customers complain and you lose money yeah. right and you sometimes might get sued so but is that success Absolutely you want to have more utilization if you build something you want people to use it mm -hmm. so is defi a good problem to have it's a brilliant problem it's to have problem. right mm -hmm. now i just hope it inspires the devs to build better infrastructure to meet the needs of the the awesome weird shit we are building on this it's yeah. just so beautiful i mean it doesn't appeal to the, the, the you know I, i mean look i'm i'm relatively old for this job right it's a 24 year old world and i'm 44 But I love this stuff. I mean, it's like the internet all over again. It's like being in '97 when I was, you know, 21, and all this shit was going around. And we're back to the same thing. Yeah. I mean, it's like dial-ups all over again, and it's really painful. It's buffering, but that's what forces people to build better people internet. Yeah. Right. That's what's you going have on. Fiber and if it, if you call it <laughs> Ethereum, great. If you call it Polkadot, great. But somebody's got to build better somebody's tech. Somebody's got to build it. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really. The of it. But that's a really good point. You know, the yeah. success is also a failure, and, and but it's better to have that success because that's yeah, the gas problem. fees are costly because so many people are using it, while other that's blockchains it. don't have the same that's right. adoption and usage. That's right. Yeah. yeah, my rent goes up. Is that a good problem or a bad problem? I don't know. Man. <laughs> I'm going to take it. You know, I mean, I'm getting call drops. I'll take it. Yeah. My site is down because everyone is using it. Yeah, sure, I'll take it. That's a really good point. Yeah. And I'd love to ask you, you know, a little bit earlier we we're talking about Uniswap and some of the specific examples that you find fascinating in terms of, you know, this whole DeFi movement. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are a lot of scams, there are a lot of, you know, projects that'll go to zero um that that don't really have much value, but there are some incredible things like It's Uniswap, just right? Unbelievable. And yeah, so there are lots of great projects in that space. right and uh, and so, so i've known stanny in switzerland for for four years now i think three to four years and he's built a really really cool app Aave, you yeah. look at the user interface on ave and it's it's absolutely beautiful it's right beautiful, it feels yeah. like a bank it, i mean like it feels it's better clean. than a bank yeah. it doesn't feel anything like a i mean when i download uh, in in 2015 when i was installing ethereum and starting to write smart contracts it was incredibly painful i couldn't build that thing right now you see these beautiful interfaces like uniswap and ave and what not and you say oh, wow i mean this this makes me cry this is how it's supposed to be yeah yeah the cust the the, the gra my grandma sh i mean shouldn't have to worry about solidity you know i mean she doesn't worry about how google runs their servers and their cloud she just sees a text box she searches she sees some uh, you know output and she sees some ads that's where where we got to take this tech the infrastructure the network you know all of the beauty that goes into switching and ss7 and all these cool protocols 5g and stuff that's for us nerds yeah, yeah, it's not for grandma yeah, so i think we have uh, so what what we what i'm seeing with the uh, ethereum this year is this evolution of the ux right metamask yeah, went on UX, mobile yesterday metamask, it's absolutely yeah, beautiful it's, great, yeah, yeah, it's just beautiful it's awesome. so now uh, ave is beautiful uh, some of the some of the copy and paste defi is also beautiful i mean it's absolutely horrible and beautiful at the same time So you know Wi-Fi is pretty cool. Yeah, Wi-Fi is really so, cool. So so there are lots of interesting ideas in there and and things 
I'll be very honest. Yeah, there's there's stuff I don't understand. I don't understand being a YouTube influencer, and I don't understand being a yield fa- yield farmer, right? Yeah. So I'm learning a lot about it, but it doesn't come naturally. So, but it's not for me. It's for the for this uh, people for a set of people. So I grew up, right? I have a story. So, you know, when you were 21 and you were watching videos, and let's say let's call them videos on the internet back in 97 and 98, you di- you dialed up and you buffered. Yeah. You watched a scene and you buffered. You and then Netflix had to ship DVDs, right? Yeah. So uh, in 1999 and 2000, I, I think I'm getting the years probably right. And we kind of knew where this was going, right? I mean, with Ethereum also, we kind of know where this technology is going to go, right? We just don't know how it's going to get there, what sort of engineering achievements, what sort of computer science has to happen to get there. But uh, we know where it needs to go. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it, this whole story has always been about the internet. Mark Andreessen and A A sixteen Z have been investing heavily, purely on that basis. So DeFi is part of that story, which is if we had to build a whole new set of applications, uh, which uh, are kind of different, right? So the internet never had money. If you ask Mark Andreessen on his podcast, then you know he would say there are two things he didn't get, right? One is he didn't get a sense of identity on the browsers. Right, so if I'm using Netscape, I might be a dog, and there is a joke about that. So there is no identity on the internet, mm. and the second thing that's not on the internet is money. Mm. It would have been blocked by the banks, and it would have been shut down by the regulators. PayPal got it more or less. With Ethereum and Bitcoin, we kind of know where we need this to go. We need to have, uh, we need to move a whole bunch of other stuff on the internet that's not there yet. Right, we need to move identity on the internet, see, yeah. and we need to move money on the internet. That's what we are all playing for. Because then the whole new system opens up. Now, how it's going to get there? Look, I'm I may not be around, right? But uh, that's the only way this has got to go. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. If we have digital identity, then you know the ownership of our own data. Yeah, yeah. It just leads to so many opportunities, just, right? Yeah, I it think just, digital it's, a, it's a game changer, right? I mean, it just suddenly gets serious. It's no longer about watching videos and whatnot. It's about uh, and lots of people are working on on different approaches, right? So, uh, you know, the f- uh, the former co-founder of Ripple was named the CTO. Steve, Steve Thomas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's building uh, Coil, which is a very interesting protocol. Ethereum is obviously the the OG, but you know who knows? Mm, still so early. Uh, but uh, I think we, c- everyone is pretty clear where this needs to go, and the vision is still the same as Bitcoin. The technology keeps evolving. It needs to evolve a lot faster. Yeah, we might have to pay for it. You know, people had to pay for airplanes. Some people died building that. It's just sad. But if nobody had died, we wouldn't be flying. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's a really good point. That's a really good sure. point. And obviously, so uh, one last question I, l- I wanted to ask you. So we talked about Ethereum, about Polkadot. You also worked with Binance, and you know Binance is, has announced that they're going to move to proof of stake with staking issue uh, with staking opportunities with BNB. Ace 2.0 is also about staking. Cardano is going to be about staking. Uh, it almost seems like you know from DeFi, like next year's proof of stake is going yeah, to be the biggest stake. topic. It in is. 2021, is it the biggest topic? Yeah. Proof of stake is, 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 is huge, right? Now, uh, proof of work works, yeah. right? We know it works. Uh, we know where it doesn't work. We know where it works, but it works, right? Bitcoin works. It's boring, but it works. It works, it works like magic, yeah. right? Uh, now, Ethereum breaks a lot, but it works. Proof of stake is a big deal. Uh, does it work? We're gonna find out, won't we? Mm-hmm. So you know, and we don't know under what circumstances. We haven't got a simulation uh, where we can say you know. There's a lot of theory around it. You can read papers about CBC Casper and other protocols and whatnot. There's a lot of distributed computing math and theory that g- that's been done, but. It'll be really nice to see how it works in the wild, right? So we haven't had a with with proof of work. We've had hard forks. We've had all these economic and and social experiments, you know, like Bitcoin. The, all the forks of Bitcoin, uh, Craig Wright's Bitcoin, and everybody else's Bitcoin. We've had Ethereum Classic and the DAO. We're gonna have to learn as we go along. So yeah. you know, we don't know where it fails because nobody are. Tezos have done a pretty good job, but nobody has really used yeah. proof of stake at scale yet, and and it's not just one thing, right? There's a lot of customization, configuration. There's lots of parameters into different proof of stake protocols, so there's a lot of math to it. We're gonna have to figure this out as we go along. 
So yeah, are you looking forward to that? Is that the ultimate challenge for 2021? Or? Yeah, I'm going to lose some money doing that. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to lose some money. <laughs> That's just how we got into this. <laughs> So yeah, it's, it's 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 but it's really good to be part of this, right? It's yeah. like just continuing on from 1997 and 1999, and and Netflix and Google and whatnot, and just just seeing this whole new generation of uh, tech, you know, technologies come around. And and when you're you know my age, you're like this 44 year old guy in a 24 year old's world. That's the only thing that makes you feel so young. It's like you know I'm still part of this fringe thing. You know, okay, I mean, I've spent my life selling blockchain and crypto to banks, right? And uh, it's a lifestyle choice. It's not that much fun sometimes, but it's great, right? So, but uh, I take the new world to the old world. That's what I do. Yeah. Now, but it really feels great to be part of this uh, incredibly imaginative, creative, you know, uh, young crowd that's got so many dreams and ideas. Yeah, there is a lot of shit that goes around too, but... You know, that's just bath water with the baby. I mean, the good stuff is all in this massive creativity and evolution that's happening at this crazy rate. And I've seen this story before. I'm just so grateful to be part of this all over again, even just to be watching it. You know? Same here. I feel so grateful. I, I feel like, you know, this is the chance of a lifetime for us. There there won't be so many financial revolutions. or We're all going to be dead, all. right? Yeah, so exactly. we might as this well be part best. of something that's, exactly. that's fun. I, I think yeah. that's exactly why people should get more involved. Thank you so much, Ajit, Thank for, so much, for the amazing insights today. Uh, right. If people want to follow you, so you're active on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little bit too active on Twitter on Chain Yoda. And, you know, I, I'm also quite active on uh, on Breaking Banks Europe podcast and Breaking Banks where I am a crypto co-host. So I cover all the all the emerging technology topics for the Breaking Banks podcast. And, uh, and I'm a Chain Yoda on Twitter. Great to meet. Awesome. Uh, great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure having you. Pleasure. And you guys heard it from somebody who actually worked with Consensus, worked with Binance, who's been seeing this from an internal perspective, which is really interesting, right? Because it's not just understanding about the technology, it's understanding the culture, the leadership that we talked about, people who actually inspire engineers to come and want to work and build on top of it, other applications wanting to build on top of it as well. So hopefully you guys have a different perspectives on how to evaluate and judge blockchains and who will be, obviously there'll be multiple, but who will be the big blockchains in the future. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and blast that bell notification so that you can get access to all these timeless interviews. Thank you so much. Premiering at a PC near you every Wednesday, 8 o'clock UK time. Take care, guys. What?